Hello, everyone. My name is Molly Mullen, and I work for the Notre Dame Sisters here in Omaha, Nebraska, and welcome to Expand Your Horizons. First, we would like to make an acknowledgement that we are speaking here today from various places in Omaha, Nebraska. We acknowledge the land and the labor of the Omaha people whose connection to this land we remember now and whose presence, past, present, and future we respect. Thank you very much. We will be uh, working with our speakers tonight and in the middle, we will be able to have a question and answer period. So please feel free to type in your questions into the Facebook comments uh, so that we can have them answered by our panel. With that, I welcome Sister Cynthia to tell us more. And Sister Cynthia, I'm just gonna ask you to unmute. I welcome you to an October 21st Expand Your Horizon. I apologize that I didn't catch that even though somebody spoke it to me, it didn't register. I am so human. So welcome to this humanly put together event. Um, the slide, oh, we have with us, um, Dr. Donna Polk is to my right. Molly just spoke. And Rita, Sister Rita Austri is our um, representative from our community team. Our title remains the same, even though the date was wrong. And this is the event called a, a series of informative gatherings hosted by the education outreach team of the Notre Dame Sisters and Associates. In preparing for this, I had a lot of lessons in language from um, Ajmal Biden. He works with MORE, which is Movement in Omaha for Racial Equity. So what we're doing is working with another group that's trying to improve the equity in the Omaha area. So again, welcome to our October 21st, 2021 event. We set up some goals when we first met with Dr. Polk. And this event, we want it to be a safe environment to raise questions. So please be encouraged to send us questions or text them to one of us if you have our phone number. When we met with Dr. Polk, we asked her, what are some major issues? And as we said in our publicity, her list was long. Healthcare, re-entry after incarceration, affordable housing, academic performance, and food insecurity. That's our main goal is to be able to hear some conversation, hear the issues from uh, Dr. Polk. We also wanted to increase sensitivity and to celebrate and honor cultural diversity. So I've prepared an outline just to give you a sense of where we're going throughout this uh, time together. Uh, first, I'll make a short comment about equality and equity. The Notre Dame Sisters in Ministry with Native Americans will be shared by Sister Rita. I will share some of my research on the birth and rebirth of the Omaha people of the forgotten minority, and our focus will be on the Omaha Ponca tribe. Dr. Polk will be sharing some stories that reveal this living legacy. So this is a group of people who are continuing to be reborn with what happens in their lives, and her ministry is very important in this effort. And at the end, we will have some actions going forward and we will be thanking you for coming. So one of the slides I found from a United Way website gave a quick explanation of equity and equality. Equality means everyone is given the same resources and opportunities. If you look at the picture on the left, each of them has a box Two of them are standing on the box and one is sitting next to it. That's equality. They all have the same thing. Equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and provides the exact resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. So the first person is tall enough to watch the game. The second one ended up with two opportunities given because she needed a little more help. And the third one, needed a very different platform in order to get the chair up on the uh, 
high enough for him to see or her. And that was the 1990 Americans with Disability Act to start looking at how do we have more equity? How do we help those who start off at a different point? So I just point that out to you. There's many images of this ball game, apple tree picking, um, golf games, but I chose this one. So at this time, um, our next topic is uh, the Notre Dame sisters in ministry with Notre Dame. Um, the, the Native American. And so we give the time now to Sister Rita. Good evening. My name is Sister Rita Ostry. I join you tonight with a short message about the relationship we, the Notre Dame sisters, have had with Native American people over the years. It was in 1937, we were invited to teach in a small Catholic elementary school on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. <clears throat> we, the school eventually was named Our Lady of Lourdes School. And in the beginning, it was a boarding school for those who lived too far away from the school. The reservation is very rural and, the, and it was easier for them to stay for the week and go home on the weekends because of the distance of traveling back and forth each day to school. And there was no bus system available at that time. Throughout the years, we the sisters ministered with the people and we lived on the reservation. We developed a close, meaningful relationship with them. We heard many sad, troubling stories about the history of broken treaties and the injustices they endured. We were present with them as they experienced tragic losses of loved ones <clears throat> because of fatal car accidents, suicide, struggles with drug and alcohol addictions. We also joined in their powwows, tribal celebrations and spiritual gatherings. I have been one of the fortunate ones to have ministered at Our Lady of Lourdes School. In 2017, I returned to Omaha after ministering <clears throat> over 25 years on the reservation. The years of sharing life with the Native Americans gave me an experience that has impacted and changed my spiritual life deeply. They challenged me to question the history I had been taught and is still being taught the history about our government's relationship with Native Americans. So much has been violated by the labeling of Native peoples as uncivilized or their spiritual beliefs being considered pagan. Much awareness and understanding is needed in order to live in right relationship with our brothers and sisters who have endured so much injustice and who have so much to offer us. I am currently serving on the leadership team of our community, and I am heartened by the efforts of LCWR, the Leadership Conference of Religious Women, who are challenging us to ask those hard questions of what part have I and we contributed to the pain and suffering of the tribal people who were the first inhabitants of the land we are now living upon. I believe what is paramount for all of us is to learn and understand the history of the origin of our country and then share what we learn with others and to do what we can in making our world a place of acceptance and respect for one another and all of creation. I borrow a phrase from the Lakota people it is the closing prayer. It is the closing phrase that they use at the end of their prayers. And so I humbly say, Mitakiwe Oase, we are all related. Thank you for joining us this evening. <clears throat> Thank you, Sister Rita brought back memories of when I was in the novitiate and they send us to teach and to get to know the ministry over at Pine Ridge Reservation. 
My role in this uh, part of our program is to share with you what I've learned and what's been out there a lot on the uh, origins of the Omaha Ponca people. According to oral tradition, there were five tribes with similar languages that lived along the Ohio River. There's a longer history before that, but these five tribes eventually developed their culture, kept their language enough so they could speak with one another. We will be focusing on the Omaha tribe since we are in Omaha, Nebraska. And sometime between 1400 and 1700, these five tribes saw what was coming from the east. So they began to move from their valley and toward the Mississippi River. When they reached the river, the Quapaw went downstream and the others upstream against the current. And that's an important phrase regarding the Omaha Ponca tribe. Mm -hmm. The Osage and the Kansa migrated north then west along the Missouri River. The Omaha, known as upstream people, and the Ponca continued north to the Iowa lands. I found a resource called Birth and Rebirth of Omaha. And so I'm giving my gratitude to them to continue my education. During the 1700s and early 1800s, the culture that was brought from the Ohio Valley was developed. By 1830, their lands had to be relinquished in Iowa. In 1836, they gave up their Missouri land. 1854 is a treaty that we need to know here in Omaha. It restricted the Omaha people to a reservation and at the same time, the name of the city was come forward. I'll explain that later. 1857 was a time there were a lot of Christian missionaries establishing schools on the reservation. One of them I read about was near Bellevue. 1865, the Ponca Omaha tribes were reduced to the present location, as you can see in the map. There was a story about 1876 and the last buffalo hunts. 1881, the government schools, the industrial ones for the boys, boarding schools, and then eventually some girls' um, schools for the girls were being developed in these um, late 1800s. 1882, there was an act of Congress that authorized the division of res reservation land individually to each member. And remember the tribal people owned their property together. So this was quite against their culture. 1958, the Bureau of Indian Affairs planned to abolish the Omaha agency, but the plan failed. Tribal leader, Wayne, uh, Alfred Wayne Gilpin is known for this statement. If my Omaha people were allowed to make their own change, they will feel brave. They will face the future standing up straight. I summarize this by saying this is a group of people who pushed, were pushed down, yet they started going against the current. They stood up against difficulties. The rebirth of the Omaha tribe continues. And what I found very inspiring was that the elders in the late 1800s were finding ways to have their culture renewed. Eventually the sacred pole and the albino uh, buffalo, sorry, it's covered up, I can't read it. Yeah, the albino buffalo hide were returned to the tribe. They had a powwow and it was be um, beginning to be a way to express traditional symbolism. They held an annual powwow as an event of cultural renewal and affirmation of tribal identity for Omaha living on and off the reservation. And I've asked Donna, Dr. Polk to explain to us some of the words that go with living on and off the reservation. Please notice the flag. At the bottom of the flag, it's against the current. This is a stream and the title of our program uh, for October 21st here is living a legacy of resistance. And this resistance is by a people who at this time by their elders started to claim their heritage. They knew the fur traders was a way to function. 
They saw the massacres that were happening in Nebraska. We had one at Ash Hollow, Ash Hollow and up at Fort Robinson. And there's a long history for you to look up on that. But those kind of um, consequences to any resistance were things that these leaders said, we have to come up with another plan. This project upstream with the language of the upstream shows the rebirth among the youth because the elders have carried on their traditions and their values. And notice that this is a, um, a youth project with the Omaha public school system. They had three goals. Some of the issues that uh, Dr. Polk mentioned. You wanna improve student academic performance, reduce suspensions and expulsions for American Indian and Alaskan native youth in Omaha metropolitan area. And they wanna increase high school graduation for the Native American. Another very interesting project I saw and read about was that each summer since 2010, Omaha Public School students did a lot of research. And in 2016, they had a picture of these three that in 2016, they decided that they would be exploring and researching the Omaha tribe. And this is the project in OPS, Making Invisible Histories Visible. I was inspired by the report in the youth when it said, while choosing to name the city after um, the tribe may seem like an honor, it does not expose the forced removal of the tribe to a reservation and the many challenges that they would face later. So thank you to these young people. They also did an interview with Dr. Um, Eduardo Zendejas, a UNO professor. He's a member of the Omaha tribe and a judge for the Omaha tribe. Very interesting history. So I invite you to listen to that video. You can find it at the invisiblehistory.ops.org website. 1983, is a very important year for the Omaha tribe. The Nebraska legislature with LB90 declared that the fourth Monday in September would be an American Indian day to lift up the culture. We know from a couple of weeks ago that on October 11th, Indigenous Peoples Day, um, 2021, that Nebraska tribes celebrated their Indigenous day at the Capitol but their indigenous day is actually in September, but we celebrate this anyway. I chose the picture on the left from the video that you can go watch. And I thought it was interesting to have a native person carrying that flag. And someday I hope to find out what's actually written on it. But that was the first nation on this land that we live on. And then came the American, the United States flag. You have the picture, some honorees. What I also noticed when I watched the video that the beginning had the Omaha tribe drummers and singing and the um, at some other time during the program, the Winnebago tribe was sharing their talent and their song. So 2020 is the year to remember too, because it was LB 848 that the legislature unicameral determined that the first um, celebration of Indigenous Day would be in Nebraska and then would continue on. So we will be able to look forward to that next year. Also at the state capitol was the honoring of Dr. Uh, Susan LaFleche Percate. And she was the first Native American in the United States to become a physician. The quote that they have on her, uh, on the stone behind her, I shall always fight good and hard, even if I have to fight alone. I thought of Dr. Polk. There are many stories that she could share with us, but sometimes I think she really felt alone in this fight. So Dr. Bacati was a physician and dealt with all that was going on among their people. And Dr. Polk is also focused on the health of people and her focus is on the mental health. Several years ago, she was, I guess a couple years ago, <laughs> um, this picture I discovered when I first heard of Dr. Polk from my friend, uh, Deborah Marbury Strong. And she said, you have to call her. So in January, a uh, while back, I called her and we talked long on the phone and we just kept visiting. And I started learning about her mission 
which is to elevate the health status of urban Indians. And this is through the Nebraska Urban Indian Health Coalition. This group was incorporated. There it is, incorporated in August 1986. She whispered it to me here. <laughs> and online, I learned that the, it's also in Lincoln, Omaha, and Sioux City. And she'll be sharing how maybe she started that work with her um, living in Lincoln at the time, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the services that you'll learn about online is the treatment, healthcare, community building, and transportation that is a part of the mission and the ministry of this um, health coalition. And with that, we'll just pause our screen sharing and see if we can learn a lot more about our special guest this evening. And I received it from Creighton because I was searching for a bio and Donna said, oh, I'll send you a better one. So <laughs> she didn't want me to read it all. So I'm, I'm honoring her request not to go through the long list of her doctoral dissertation, which I find interesting because I have a lot of nurses in my family. It's a study of the cultural beliefs of advanced practice nurses. Maybe she'll tell us more. But right now, I think I would just ask you to accept our welcome and the, our gratitude from me because the picture behind her on the flyer is right here in her office. It's a huge picture, has a wonderful story. And maybe she'll share that with us too tonight. So the next 20 or 30, 20 minutes, five minutes. <laughs> she, how am I going to talk that long? I said, oh, you have so many stories to share. Mm -hmm. So I welcome you. Well, thank you, Sister Cynthia. It's quite an honor for me to be here. We've had many interesting conversations. Sister Joy, Sister Rita, Sister Cynthia have become friends of ours here at the coalition and in my heart. And I really want to tell you the most interesting story about Sister Cynthia. When she called and asked if she could come and visit with me, I thought, oh, okay, I wonder what she wants. And so <laughs> that morning when I awakened, I said to myself, no matter what happens, I'm not going to bring up the boarding school issues. I'm sure she has nothing to do with that. Her order has nothing to do with it. It had really hit a lot of the headlines. I was getting a lot of communications from my colleagues about the travesty involving First Nations students uh, whose bodies had been found at the boarding schools. So I promised myself I was not gonna do anything or say anything disrespectful or which could be interpreted as disrespectful. So she arrived on time. And I said, well, let's have lunch because the elders are in the building on Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. So we had, we were going to have lunch. They brought it to my office, mm -hmm. as I remember. And she said, before we eat, I have something to say. And I said, oh, okay. I thought she was going to say grace, honest. And she began to say how apologetic she was about the Borden School issue. And of course, I was just very surprised and humbled by the fact that um, she brought this up. And I asked her, I said, would you mind if we go downstairs? The elders are down there. And I'd like for you, if you don't mind, to say to them what you said to me. And you went down there. And I introduced her. And she made this, not just a simple statement, but a heartfelt statement about that issue. And one of the elders, Pat is her name, she spoke up about her experience and oh my goodness it was just amazing and so that really became something very important to me in terms of our relationship and so as we prepared for tonight of course I'm always excited to talk about the coalition and the work that we do and the fact that we're very, very close to accomplishing a very important part of my life, and that is 
our ability to renovate a space that will be able to accommodate not only the needs of my staff, but of the community. And that we will have 26,000 square feet of space in South Omaha at 23rd and N Street, where we can once again, after, after COVID is over, or even if we can accommodate the community by having funerals, memorial dinners, things that the 10,000 square feet we're in now don't allow us to do because we are very, very protective of the community that comes here, the clients who are in our treatment program and my staff. So we have had to adopt CDC guidelines and both Sister Cynthia and I have been vaccinated. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm looking forward to moving so <laughs> that uh, we can begin to function as we have since 1986. I started in 91. And I mean, it was 1991, not 1891. <laughs> I think some people think I'm so old that I've been here for over a hundred years, but anyway, no. Um, so um, I'll just see if you have anything else well, you'd the, like to talk about. The memory of going to see the tired moccasins is a strong one for me. Um, it brought me back to my young adult years when I first started learning a little bit about more than was in our history books. Um, but as time went on, um, Donna, and you shared about how you ended up here, you know, you started in, I believe, Lincoln when, you, Lincoln, moved, when yes. you moved to Nebraska. So could you tell us a little bit more about that transition from, you know, building what was in Lincoln mm -hmm. and moving here, mm -hmm. and then now it's in Sioux City, mm -hmm. too. So yes, a little well, that would help the people understand the value of this health coalition. First of all, it's important to understand what the term urban Indians means. And this label was given to native people who were being relocated east to west. And they didn't have a reservation to be on because mm -hmm. they were going from New York, Rhode Island, Connecticut, to Los Angeles, to San Francisco. And the Indian Health Service recognize the fact that many of them had lost their ability to benefit from their tribal membership. So the concept of having urban Indian programs was developed. And in 1986, three forward looking people, um, Sid Bean from the Lincoln Indian Center, uh, Alice, uh, excuse me, not Alice Roach, and now I'm forgetting the person in Omaha that was the head of the Indian Center up here. And then I believe it was Elaine Provost from Sioux City. They came together to form the Nebraska Urban Indian Health Coalition. And that is why we have a service area, Lincoln, Omaha, and Sioux City. At the time I was working at the Lincoln Indian Center, I was director of counseling there. And Sid had received another job opportunity. And he said, well, would you be interested in being <laughs> the executive director of the coalition? And I didn't know what that was, but I said yes, because he had been my mentor. He had adopted me into his family. And if he was leaving Lincoln and leaving the Indian Center, I thought, what else can I do? Where can I go? And I ended up as the CEO or executive director in those days in 1991. And so since that time, we've been able to accomplish a lot of the vision that Sid had and that I had the privilege of adopting. And one of them that was very important was a clinic. We were a part of the Indian Chicano health system that predated One World. We were the Indian part of that. And of course, in those days, in the 80s and, and, and very early 90s, we focused on uh, OBGYN and pediatrics. And so when the, the relationship changed, 
um, I decided that in Lincoln, there had never been a nonprofit community health center. So I decided we would start one and we partnered with St. Elizabeth's Regional Medical Center. I was very ambitious and I called our clinic the Nebraska Urban Indian Medical Center. And that was about 1995. And that's still the name. It's still the name. And we're a little bigger. Yeah, we had uh, four little rooms. Mm -hmm. And of course, Saney's donated furniture. They provided us with front and back office staff. And uh, so now we're on our own. We've been on our own since uh, 2000. And I moved to Omaha in 2000 because I wanted to try to build what we were doing up here. Mm -hmm. And so that was my move. But I had originally lived in Omaha from 1964 until I moved to Lincoln in 72. <laughs> so I Welcome have, home. <laughs> yeah, I have a, quite a history with Omaha. Right. So when you start setting up services, you're uh, online, it says you have the, um, can't read the small writing, but there okay. were four things listed there. <laughs> so as you look at the issues that you've been working with, um, that long list of the, like, I know I was showing the addiction services mm -hmm. here. There was a crash place. I was mm -hmm. showing the garden, mm -hmm. um, the Etowa lunches here mm -hmm. that we were eating, and the, the room for the tired moccasins. I yes. mean, all of those yes. had narrow hallways, narrow mm -hmm. doors. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad to hear you describe that you were able to go to a bigger building. Yes, and have an elevator, because that's an elevator. often a barrier. Now, if anyone comes and they can't make access to the second floor, then we accommodate them by going downstairs. Mm -hmm. But we will actually have an elevator in the new building. The other part of that building that I didn't, of that project that I didn't mention, was the fact that we have 44 affordable housing units right across the street. Mm -hmm. And that's called Eagle Heights also. And it's affordable housing and it's um, efficiencies to three bedrooms. And we're, we partnered with Arch Icon on that project. And I'm just so proud of it. Is, and it's not just for Native people. So if anyone is really interested in housing, um, you can go on our website and call us and we can give you additional information about that. And it's wonderful. The most wonderful feature, and I love this, is that every unit has a washer and dryer. Ah. So no one has to worry about dragging mm -hmm. their clothes to the laundromat mm -hmm. or to the basement or anything like that. And when you go to your new facility, you'll have the housing also there? The housing is right across the street yeah, from right the new facility, street. yes. It says on this description here about intertribal treatment program. That seemed to be an important part of the lives of some of the people oh. I met here. If you mm -hmm. could comment on how that developed, what were some of the difficulties? And oh, wow. Well, initially, we were at St. Patrick's, the old convent on 15th and Martha. How about that? See? Uh, oh my <laughs> the creator has brought us together, even oh. though, you know. But anyway, so, um, yes, we have a history, a long and storied history, trying to provide services for Native people in all 50 states, we've had people come from as far away as Alaska. And then we serve the 17 tribes in the Great Plains and mm -hmm. any other native person. That's an interesting detail, 17 tribes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the intertribal. Yeah. Yes, that's mm -hmm. the intertribal. And we have a contract with the Indian Health Service, which is why we limit access to native people. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there are many reasons for that in terms of the exposure to cultural activities that non-natives might not understand, the sweat lodge, mm -hmm. you know, um, smudging, things that they may not be familiar and may not be comfortable with. And so we are very proud of the work that we do. It's interesting, when I first started at the Lincoln Indian Center, the primary addiction that native people had that we served were, was alcohol, alcohol. And I mean alcohol from any source. It could be found in Lysol. It could be found in-, in, in Oh yeah, 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 cough medicine. And now it's methamphetamines. 
And so we take a cultural approach and then we also incorporate trauma-informed care, understanding that so many people have been traumatized that we try to ask the question, what happened to you? If we don't ask it personally, we dig around trying to figure out what happened to you to cause you to resort to this form of addiction, mm -hmm. to address the pain that you feel. And it can be a number of things. It can be abandonment. And when I mean that, it could be the mother who, for some reason or other, was taken from her child. And the child just has never lost that longing for that maternal relationship that no one else can give. No one else can give. And then, of course, you know, I bring, I have to bring up missing and murdered. The MMIW. Um, yeah, MMIW, yeah. If you haven't looked it up, please do. It was another one of my largest um, educations that mm -hmm. uh, murdered and missing mm -hmm. Indian women. Mm -hmm. And I want to add to that, that uh, the one person I know who was, who was missing is Merle Saul. He was a gentleman that often visited my office here, right here in this building. Mm. And he was from Santee. That's on the north side. Yes, uh, yes. North, like but he, Dakota. yes. Mm -hmm. And they have looked for Merle. I think Merle's been missing over four or five years. And it's just sad because I know that the focus is on women and it should, should be because there are many more women missing and many more of them are subject to being victimized, whether it's through human trafficking, mm -hmm. sex trafficking, laboring trafficking, you know. But I just often think of Merle because he's somebody that I know that one day he didn't show up. And I say, anybody see Merle? And then I found out that other people were looking. In fact, there, the police had issued uh, you know, all point bulletin looking for him, not for any criminal act, but he was missing. Mm -hmm. So I just needed to say that. I'm a, a teacher. And so of course, when I saw the project upstream and you introduced me to your mm -hmm. staff person mm -hmm. working with that, mm -hmm. how did that get going? Because it's connected with OPS. It's and connected with OPS. And we've had a connection with OPS, the Native Indigenous Centered Education Program or NICE as it's called. Well, I'm really big into education and it doesn't have to be a PhD. It can be a certificate from a welding program mm -hmm. at MCC or a little priest or, you know, a community college, but you have to be able to show that you have learned to do something. And so I was concerned when I started looking at data from OPS, mm -hmm. and I see that the grid is going down, that the success rate for graduation, there are other indicators such as truancy, mm -hmm. uh, disciplinary actions that have to be taken against Native kids. So listening to the metaphor, and Desmond Tutu often said this, and other great leaders, let's look upstream to see why the babies are in the water. Uh, upstream. Yeah. And so one of the elders, the story says, went upstream to see, where are these babies coming from? So I thought, let's go upstream and see what's happening in the home. Mm -hmm. You know, do these young people that are at school age, do they have a mattress? Do they have a mattress to sleep on? Because some of the some of the residences where they live, there's not room for beds for everybody. Mm -hmm. So you just put a mattress. In the old days, when I was a kid, it was called a pallet. People had a pallet on the floor. But now at least, thin. yeah, yeah. Now it's mattresses. And then could they have a bed if they could have one? One of our Client said if their family had a table with chairs where they could all sit down and eat. How pitiful is that? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, 
food. Should a child have to go to school to have breakfast? My grandmother gave me oatmeal. I still eat oatmeal. Mm -hmm. Almost every morning I eat oatmeal. Of course, it's instant. She would be horrified. <laughs> uh, but she want you to grind it. Well, yeah, or that old with the little guy on the front of oh, the yeah. box, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, then clothes. Winter comes, do they have the clothes that they need? So the fabulous, fabulous team that I put together, John Paul is the director, Dr. Paul is the director, Monty, Alec, and Sky. Man, and they're diverse. They're diverse. John Paul, and remember we talked to him about his name and we knew mm -hmm. he was going to be good because of Pope John Paul. His name. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, and see, sorry, me and uh, Sister Cynthia, we joke a lot. We're developing a history. We have <laughs> secrets. <laughs> but anyway, we have a young man um, who, who um, is from San Carlos. He's Apache. We have a young lady who is Dene. She's from Flagstaff. We have an LGBTQ gentleman who's also a veteran, and he has Cherokee descendancy, but he's also African American. Mm -hmm. And then John Paul, and I know I'm getting into trouble because I can't remember. He's from Oklahoma, his tribal Not Nebraska, because no, he said, he's, I'm not from here. No, he's from, yeah. and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember his tribal affiliation. I apologize, John Paul. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, so that is our project upstream, and we know we're going to make a difference. And people will look to us to see how did we increase graduation rates, school attendance, a decrease in touristy or other disciplinary actions. That's our goal. I'm a, um, I teach GED and did more of it in the past, but mm -hmm. I just wonder sometimes. It says here you worked with practicum students, at colleges, universities. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember us talking about that, but I noticed it here. <laughs> that is yeah. again helping young yeah. adults who yeah. are going to make a big influence in the future yeah. understand what this coalition is about. And in healthcare, we have to do that because we all know, or those of us who follow the COVID 19 data, that if you have underlying health uh, conditions and you end up with the, the virus, that there is a greater chance that you will have long-term effects or maybe even fatal uh, outcomes. And a lot of it has to do with underlying disease, chronic illness, cancer, diabetes, COPD. And a lot of this is because of health disparities. We need to make sure our health care professionals are culturally competent. Come on, you know? Uh, it doesn't matter where you're from in the world, but you have to understand the people that you're treating. You know, you can't be ignorant to the fact that it can be environmental. You know, EPA in the early 2000s spent, allegedly, $300 million trying to clean up lead mm -hmm. in North Omaha and East Omaha. What's the effect of lead? Read anything coming out of Flint and you'll see why our prisons may be full because of lead exposure. And I'll leave that up to you to because research the, that. The mental impact of exactly. that lead too, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, challenges. <laughs> I, watched, I was just kind of checking our time It's here. okay. It's about quarter till. All right. And I was trying to figure out um, those Challenges are the barriers to getting what you need, whether it's funding or volunteers. Um, oh, you mentioned the students. Uh, we're so lucky in that we get students from UNMC, specifically the College of Nursing, UNO, College of St. Mary, and Creighton locally, mm -hmm. and Metro Community College. And that's another thing. You mentioned GED. I feel that Randy Smazel who is the president of Metro Community College, which is, oh my goodness, if you haven't had a chance to walk around Metro, it's phenomenal. It's so beautiful. The buildings are just modern um, and he's so approachable. He's so approachable. But he, when I visited him about my vision and I said, I think I wanna have GED 
and computer labs. He said, I'll help you. Let me know. What do you need? Oh, my goodness. Can you believe that? So um, I'm just waiting because I know there are people that dropped out of school for some reason. And if we can get them back on a fast track, such as GED, and then get them in, they just opened this fabulous new auto mechanics um, classroom place. Oh, my goodness. I have an old raggedy car. And so yeah. just use the two. <laughs> no. Uh, my community is listening. Sorry. Okay. No, um, they'll have to learn the electric car, though. Yes, yeah. yes, and yes, yes. Part yes. Of the well, I'm new, sure they will. New employment that exactly. will be coming up is exactly. working with that. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Metro. And when I first moved to town, came back after being gone for a while, uh, one of the things I attended was the September Wow. Right. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed that thoroughly. Mm -hmm. It brought back all kinds of memories from my young adult years in mm -hmm. Pine Ridge. And then a couple of days ago, you helped me understand that there's a separate celebration, the fourth Monday. <laughs> I just wanted well, you had know, such a it's a high I energy know. there yeah. for that day. Yeah, I wasn't gonna uh, bring that up, but um, um well I was and by accident I was at a September fourth Saturday celebration mm -hmm. and I, I see the information but it's mm -hmm. um it, yes it's, because we we have a very liberal um holiday celebration type mentality here so we have been celebrating Native American Day the fourth Monday for years. 1983 yeah. is what we and found, so, yeah. but and you were yeah, doing it before, doing it before that, right? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, no, we, we that's one of the holidays that we observe. And then Metro would have its powwow that weekend. Yeah. And so then when they came up with Indigenous Day mm -hmm. in October, I'm going to have to figure out from my board mm -hmm. uh, which one are we going to go with. Because we, you know, I don't think we can take both. So we have to celebrate yes. long two weeks there. We <laughs> have a beginning. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, were there any cultural things that you would want to share, uh, maybe from the tired moccasins that you've seen them bring forward? Or uh, like when I met your gardener and I only mm -hmm. looked at the plants from a distance, mm -hmm. um, that, that just seemed like a healthy thing for participants here to mm -hmm. gain an understanding mm -hmm. of growing food and many of them know mm -hmm. they know about dandelions and milkweed and um, plant other plant-based mm -hmm. type things and they also know the correlation between food insecurity uh, because if you can't almost walk to the grocery store you're in trouble because then you go to a convenience store that's right around the corner and you start eating pizza mm -hmm. and hot dogs and things that aren't as healthy. So that's why we have a master gardener who comes and we have raised beds because I don't believe the land is lead free here. Mm -hmm. So we have raised beds, we bring dirt in and then the elders plant. They also plant sage and sweet grass, mm -hmm. you know, um, the cultural plants. Yes, is the what cultural I was plants. Talk that's about. correct, right. and that is so, very important. Mm -hmm. And so, I never thought of myself as being an elder, but I am. And we're very grateful to the Eastern Nebraska Office on Aging for providing us or having us as a male site. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's very important. That the socialization is very important because we're going to find out if the pandemic ever ends, that people have experienced anxiety because of loneliness, isolation, lack of resources that they need. You know, it's easy to say, well, we've got a pantry. How do you get there? How do you get there? So transportation is one of the That's services one of those, yeah. that we offer. Uh, people can call a zip cab and we'll pay for it as long as it's to a health related type activity, doctor's appointments, grocery stores, things of that coming here mm -hmm. or going to another facility, you know, in a cultural center or the Adams Park Center, wherever people feel comfortable. Well, but we want you to come here and be a tired moccasin. <laughs> Put the moccasins in. Let them rest aside. Yes. I want to see if Molly, if um, 
there's any comments or questions um, that would have come for us to yes let me to just time? bring myself into the view to see okay. more than your name there. <laughs> i know sorry uh let me That's just okay. get myself here we go okay okay we do have a few questions i hope that sister rita is still around sister rita if you're here we have a question for you most of our questions are for uh, Dr. Pope, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Let me start off by asking Dr. Pope, um, do you work with Dr. Yellow Robe and the Four Directions or which groups are the biggest partners of the Nebraska Urban Indian Health Coalition? Wow. You know, I'm, I've met Dr. Yellow Robe, but I've not had an opportunity to work with her because I'm not sure in what capacity that would be. Um, but we work with so many collabor uh, collaborators. Um, we're so happy that Dr. Siobhan Westcott is here at the College of Public Health. We welcome her. We've had an excellent relationship with the University of Iowa. Uh, the University of North Dakota, we've done some research for them dealing with kinship mm -hmm. and looking at our elders who often are caring for young children. And we want to see whether or not there are any obstacles that prevent them from doing this in an effective way. But we have a lot of relationships in Douglas County also. I have another question about, <clears throat> I've got a couple more questions for you and then I'll ask Dr. Rita and Dr. Uh, Sister Rita and Sister Cynthia a few things. Um, another question is about pay inequity. Uh, Native American women earn about 80 cents for every dollar that a white man has earned. Latina women earn about 55 cents. Black women, women earn about 83 cents. White women earn about 78 cents and Asian women earn about 87 cents when we're talking about uh, uh, pay inequity towards white men who get paid doing the same thing for the same work. Can you speak to that at all, Dr. Polk? Oh my goodness, that's not true here. In fact, I just, it was brought to my attention that I didn't have enough males working here. And so in a matter of a couple of months, I've corrected that. And I think we went to two, from two to seven. But certainly not uh, in your organization, but is that an issue that you see oh, well, of in course Omaha it's an with issue. the people that you serve? Of course it's an issue. I am horrified that a lot of the progress we made in the 70s, we're losing that ground, okay? As far as rights of women and people are concerned. And if people don't register and vote, it's only gonna get worse. So absolutely, there are inequities, but you know what? I am the diversity and inclusion officer for my organization. I look around and I say, wait a minute, this is not right. Okay, I don't need to hire anybody. Thank you. Now, you were speaking earlier about uh, the LGBTQ community uh, in the Native American community in Omaha. Can you tell me about the LGBTQ work being done in the urban Native community? We know the history is vast and maybe different for different tribes, but can you speak to the LGBTQ progress that's happening in the Omaha urban native community? Wow, yes. And like I said, I am very, very thrilled to have hired Monty and I'm gonna get in trouble because I can't think of his last name, but Monty is very visible. He was on the Ellen show, but that's not why I hired him. <laughs> but his partner uh, and husband, I guess is the correct term, is um, a, it off it, and then Monty is a veteran. And we have had two-spirit training. I had the first two-spirit training back in probably 1993 or four, when our youth planned their own health conference. And one of the things they, one of the topics they wanted to have covered was Two spirit. That's what. Can you explain to anybody it? watching who's not familiar what two spirit means? Can I what? Can you explain to anybody oh, watching yes, who yes, doesn't yes. know what two spirit means? Yes, it means in the na in native culture, people who are two spirit are often able to do the work of both genders. For example, if they were needed someone to do what was called women's work, they could do that we would refer to them as LBGTQ, okay? But the term that I know, and maybe things have changed, 
Uh, we work closely with Lisa Schultz from the um, Women's Fund. She's been very progressive in, in, in inclusivity. And so we are going to continue to work in that area by starting a youth support group. And my upstream staff is going to uh, provide services for that. And I am sure those young people who are having issues whether it's binary issues, um, uh, whatever issues around gender that they're struggling with, we will be able to help them that. If we can't help them directly, we know who to refer them to. And, and somebody just asked worked, while you were speaking. I just say oh. one more thing? We've yes. worked in the past with, uh, I know I'm gonna mess this up too. I won't say anymore. Okay. okay. Well, somebody just like asked while you're speaking. Um, two spirit idea because I think that's such a positive way to recognize another value, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's it's not a value that's seen in our um, Western European mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. But anytime I, when I first heard about it was when I worked at the Family Life Office, and there was a book on the shelf, and I thought, "What's this two spirit stuff?" I like mm -hmm. spirit stuff. Yeah. And I read it, and I thought, "Oh, this is honoring." how the biology functions in our world. Yes. <laughs> anyway, yes. so the yes. science and the biology, you know, it's, it's a part of my own science background, but okay, Molly. Back to oh, no, just somebody just wrote in while you were answering that question. How can they find that Ellen interview and who is the Monty who was on Ellen? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. It, it, can, can they just send me an email or a text? And, I'll and if they look my... up Ellen Monty native. Yes. What the issue was, uh, Monty and his the the two of them wanted money to have a surrogate, uh, a, a baby provide the a surrogate provide them with an infant, and that's going to happen, I believe, in February. That's wonderful. Okay, I've yeah. got more questions for you, Dr. Polk. No, well, Don, we have to give Dr. Let's let's let's. Uh, Read it. Yes, Sister Rita, so I can calm down. I okay. get really excited when I talk about uh, it, so Sister so. Rita, it says, um, you worked with students on the Pine Ridge Reservation for something like 20 years. Know, what so concerns good. and questions came up with students who were born and raised on the Pine Ridge Reservation over and over again? Oh, you might be muted. That might be my fault. No, that's okay. There you are. Okay, you're back. There was always the struggle of feeling accepted when they went off the reservation. And suicide among, among young, young children was evident there. So, and as I was out there, I went to a workshop once and so many of the students I taught heard stories of their, the generations before them. And I learned about what is called historical grief. And Dr. Polk talked about the trauma that um, affects people when they're abused. And in working with the youngsters, they, they feel safe on the reservation. They want to be a part of what's going on and developing in, the, in our nation. And yet it, it is the thing of living in two worlds but knowing they're not quite accepted in the other world. And they would have dreams and hopes and they would say, I wanna grow up and I wanna be a lawyer. And um, over the years I was there, the concern for education and knowing they needed education was growing and they were striving to do that more and more. But it, in my early years, they would get they would graduate and uh, young students that went to our elementary school would then graduate at Red Cloud and we would hear them going off to Creighton or going to uh, Jesuit schools in Milwaukee. And we were all excited for them. And unfortunately, by December, it was the lonesomeness, the wanting to be connected. It was too hard. But that, it, that seems to be changing now and colleges and universities are developing support systems for 
for the native students on their campuses. So that's been a, a great growth, I would say. And no, Molly, sure. I want to say oh, that- Go ahead, I was I, gonna ask. I, I stepped out and I got the brochure and Monty's last name is Foreman, F-O-R-M-A-N. Okay, so Monty Foreman. Monty Foreman, right. And we can look him and up online. he is the youth and family mental health specialist. Now, uh, Dr. Polk, I'd like to ask you to just a little bit weigh in on what uh, Sister Rita was saying about the difficulty since you work for the, it, Nebraska Urban Indian Health Coalition, um, what you've noticed when people come from the reservation, come to Omaha, either go to college or start working here, and what that, what the difficulties of the transition are and how to, if there, if, if there's an, a way to overcome it. Oh, well, absolutely. There is possibly a way to overcome it because like I said, one of our Project Upstream staff is from um, uh, San Carlos Apache, uh, reservation, which is about 120 miles north of Phoenix. I've been there twice. But, um, you know, just being in an area where your name could cause you to be ridiculed, or if you were a male and you got long braids, you could be bullied even in grade school. But just not understanding, you know, the differences and not respecting them is the issue. And of course, we've had people who they are not used to riding a bus because they don't have buses where they live. There might be a bus on the reservation, but not where they live because Pine Ridge itself is huge. You see what I'm saying? Standing Rock is huge. And so just helping them to understand that we care about them and we're here to help and just slowly but surely acclimating them because we're even co-ed. And so having men and women 19 and up in the same facility working on the same issues can be challenging. So I see that I've got five more minutes. I've got about five or six more questions. So I'll see if I can get these out quickly. Sister Cynthia, you have begun research into educating yourself on these topics. Where would another person trying to educate themselves even begin? Talk to Donna. <laughs> <laughs> Come and talk to the tired moccasins. Yes, that would be a good start because. Is there a website? Is there a Facebook group? How do you even begin to enter a world that you've maybe well, never been in contact with? For me, with? it was, I did go to their website, which is. You know, if they rewatch the video here, they can see all these I get all these references I put on the video. They can pause it and mm -hmm. get it off of my slides. Mm -hmm. um, just visiting the Facebook for uh, this health coalition on the Facebook site is where I learned about the moccasins. I learned about the gardening, the health. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so much right there. And then um, checking in with UNO because the professor out there that I learned about through the um, the history, the hidden history, revealing that history. The OPS system has from 2010 to current. I mean, there's reports created by these students. So depending on the age of the person, if this is a young person, it would be interesting for them to see, or for all of us to see what these young people come up with um, and how they think about what they're reading. So that's kind of I've yeah. had lots of good stuff on their website. Yeah, come and visit with John Paul and with. Mm -hmm. And of course, we'll post these. We'll post all the slides. We'll post all the links that we've come up with in our Q and A tomorrow morning. I probably won't post them tonight before it gets too late. Right. Thank you, Dr. Polk. I've got that link, so I'll I'll definitely send that out in the morning. You know, I've just gotten two questions from two different people that are kind of similar, so I'm going to try to combine them. Can you speak about the health and social issues that, that impact Native Americans that also affect people of color in urban Omaha? Let me read the other one because it might be this. No, okay, so this is two different questions. The health issues that affect Native Americans and people of color in Omaha. And then somebody else asked, can you tell me more about cultural competency when it comes to treating Native Americans what questions should nurse practitioners be asking at the doctor's office? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, my major concern is lack of access. 
Because if you live across the street from a hospital and you're in a wheelchair, how do you get there? And so that's often a barrier. Where are the services and how do you access them? And then once you get there, suppose you have the belief that this healthcare provider knows everything, then what information do you need to give them? You see what I'm saying? And then understanding the role of the environment that a person lives in. A lot of people don't understand that in America, a person of color, when they wake up in the morning, they got to figure out what's my day going to be like? How am I going to get the rent money? How am I going to get from a to B without getting stopped by the police. And I know my in transit sticker is outdated because I don't have money to get the license plate. You see what I'm saying? And then, so how's that all going to work? And then, yes, I realize that my children are not the weight that the CPS worker thinks they should be, but I don't have money for groceries to feed them. They say there's a little commercial on TV that almost brings tears to my eyes every time I see it, where the little kid goes to the refrigerator and it mm. says, I want to eat, eat, eat. And it's like, what? You know what I'm saying? So that's what people of color have to contend with and then we're living on Indian land. Come on now. And I will ask people, typically students, when I go to speak, which isn't as often anymore, and I will say, do you know how Omaha got its name? Do you know how Nebraska got its name? No, they have no idea. You see what I'm saying? And to speak to that, you know, I'm born and raised in Nebraska and have been a huge Nebraska fan my entire life. And I knew where the names came from, but it wasn't until we started researching this topic that I realized that naming your town and your state after a tribe is kind of an, a, an empty gesture at the end of the day. Yeah, but the tribe named it this land. They named it. I mean, come on. But when the settlers decide to say our city and our state are named this. Yeah, I understand, Molly. And I know you have good intentions and I adore you. And so <laughs> I adore you. Okay, we've only got a few minutes left. Let me ask a few more questions. Um, uh, okay, got that one done. Okay. Um, uh, speaking more about Merle Saul, they, somebody wants to know what how to spell his name, how to find out more information. And then they said, where can we find resources about missing and or murdered native people, especially women? Uh, can, how can people not in law enforcement assist in supporting in any way? And somebody also followed up with especially trafficking. Wow, yes. Well, I think attention is being paid to that. I think Senator Tom Brewer who represents the Gordon area, and to my knowledge was the first native uh, person elected to the legislature. Um, he, his office would be a resource, but I also think if you Google missing and murdered in Nebraska, there's more attention being paid to it. And if you ask me how to spell Merle's name, I believe it's M-E-R-L-E. And I may have that wrong because I never really spelled his name, but the last name is S-A-U-L. Okay. So, uh, so uh, but yes, do pay attention to that. And one of the reasons Nebraska is a hot spot is because of I-80. When it comes to the MMIW, just know those four letters, M-M-I-W, Murdered and Missing Indian Women, that's what you told me to look up one time. So I did, and I learned about how it started in Canada and this organization has gotten big. I think at this point, we'd like to move toward our actions. One of which is, <laughs> it's not on a slide, but go look up <laughs> MMIW and you will find out. And, we can, and we'll list that link after tonight. I, can I ask one more question because Sister Rita has been waiting so patiently and this oh. is one question for Sister Rita and Dr. Paul. 
Okay. Um, Sister Rita, can you tell me, somebody asked a little bit about uh, suicide prevention on the reservation. And I wanna bring Dr. Polk into that because I'm assuming suicide prevention is a very important part of, of the urban Native American community as well. So can you give me a little bit of information about your experiences uh, hearing about discussing, experiencing um, this incredibly devastating issue on Pine Ridge Reservation? Um, that was a very uh, urgent issue to deal with the last seven years of us on the reservation. And I remember <clears throat> um, we, we, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation invited elders from from Wyoming and other reservations. And one morning we gathered our junior high students and took them to a ceremony. People would, we would pray together about it and talk about it. And then <clears throat> we brought all the students from the schools to the football field and everybody wrote on a link a construction piece paper and we linked it all together and we had another prayer service reservation wide. People are very concerned about it. They have uh, I, uh, another group of young high school students go around and do skits for the students in the elementary schools. It, is, it has become an urgent issue to address and the health health care providers and the counselors on the reservation were coming together, working together, providing various programs that could be used within the school. And Dr. Polk, could you maybe speak to, to that issue in an urban setting? Yes, we're very concerned about the high rate of suicide among Native people, which is often compared to that of veterans. And we know that veterans have a very high, or people in the military, not just the veterans. But we try to uh, approach the issue by training people. It's called QPR, question, persuade, and refer. You know, if a person is giving away their uh, items, you know, especially things that they treasure, uh, and it doesn't matter how old they are. I know I had talked with Chairman Taken Alive from Standing Rock and he's passed away, but he was concerned and he asked me what I thought about the fact that children know what the ritual is going to be once they're gone. And if we're telling people that you're gonna meet your relatives in heaven and everything's gonna be great, if you loved grandma and grandma fixed you a good breakfast and protected you and told you stories. Mm -hmm. And then you're living in an abusive situation. And you know that if you die, you're going to be with grandma. What are your options when you're nine or 10 years old? I couldn't believe that kids that age were killing themselves. In fact, I said to uh, mm -hmm. Chairman Taken Alive because many of them were hanging themselves. And I said, are you sure they're not playing the choking game? And he said, no, he didn't think so, you know, but that's a conversation ongoing we need to have because non-Indian kids in Douglas County are killing themselves, okay? So we have to make sure that when we are addressing these issues, we don't just limit it to one racial group or one gender because people tend to have friends outside. And as we bring Afghan uh, refugees into this community, we've got to make sure that we find people who speak their language. And I don't know if it's Arabic or Kurdish or what the native language is from where Or any from. specific, yeah, exactly. regional language. Because think of how horrible that is if you're thinking about the relatives that couldn't get on the plane and you have survivor's guilt. So we have a lot of work to do in the area of mental health, getting past COVID, getting past the isolation we suffered, the people we've lost, we have to pay attention to that. Okay, and now Cynthia, I'm ready to move on. I just wanted to say since no, I, gotta give, I gotta give my two cents since I, I, I spent some time on the Rosebud Reservation, but there was word going around when I lived there about a seven-year-old who decided mm -hmm. 
he got on YouTube and learned how to tie a noose mm -hmm. and hung himself on purpose, mm -hmm. which was absolutely devastating. And then I was teaching kindergarten through eighth grade uh, religious studies, uh, like as an after school program. And I would ask all the kids what they wanted to do to grow up when they want what they wanted to do when they grew up. And I had this spitfire gal who I just thought was going to like set the world on fire. She says, well, I think when I graduate from high school, I'll just do what my brother did. And I thought, oh, go to the military, leave the reservation, go to college. And she said, no, he killed himself. And I'm probably going to do that too. And she was nine years old at the time when she told me that um, this was about, this was a few years ago. Um, but it really hit that, that question just really hits home for me personally. Um, so there's plenty of resources out there to, to continue that discussion, but I just wanted to put that out there with you all. Thank you, Molly. Appreciate that. Do you think we'd be continuing with slide 20? I will absolutely continue with the slide. Give me <laughs> one <you>. moment. <laughs> We're going to go faster because we covered some of these. Things. I know. Gosh, this is just such, this is something yeah, that touches like our hearts so left. much that it's hard not to go on and on. Before 8.30. <laughs> okay, so we're here on your next slide. Take action. I think this is what everybody actually wants to know about at this point. And at this point, I was uh, asking Donna, I think you've already mentioned a few things, but that's the phone numbers, Facebook, um, website. Your action could be go on there, see if there's something you can connect with. Is there anything you want to point out particularly? Well, we can always accept donations, and with <laughs> winter coming, it can be a pair of gloves, a, a little cap or something, or of course, any kind of monetary donation that you might uh, send would help us. And then as spring comes around, you can, there's a picture on there about the garden, so she made reference to yes. the garden already. Yes. The orange t-shirts have their own story, so yeah. Um, yeah. we'll explore that later. Yes. The next slide. Um, this one was already referenced to about mm -hmm. the new site. The, it's mm -hmm. uh, the South it's at It's at 23rd and N. Oh. So just one block to the east of 24th. And so you'll see it. You can't miss it. I think that's not a typo. I cut it there, right? Yeah. There. Anyway, the point is, that's it. We also wanted to acknowledge that uh, there is um, Indigenous Peoples Day that the Mitchell Museum sponsored on the history of boarding school. They said that they would be having this up on their website. So there's a recording. If you want to explore and learn more of the history and the description, this uh, Laureen gave that explanation. One more, one more click. Okay. And this, the goal that they had was to educate and to be respectful of the topic. She said, um, this Mary Smith said, we understand that lots of truth telling and healing and action is due around this topic. Mm -hmm. So that's how we want to encourage you to learn more. Molly's gonna comment a little bit about this. Oh, sure. Take a trip. This is right next to my house. So if anybody lives near 50th and Ames, like I do, uh, there are uh, a four or five great Lakota statues, which is going to teach you an incredible amount. Uh, it's a great place to go walking uh, and meet people and also just learn a lot about local culture without having to go out of town. So this is located in central Omaha. Um, and you might see me there because I go walking there about twice a week. Basis, well, no, put it on the one. There you go. Yes. So that's at 44th and Ames. And then from the Omaha tribe, we go to take a trip. You can experience the heritage of the Winnebago Ho-Chunk tribe. They have 12 statues there. I went with one of the sisters to see it with Father Baron, whom I used to work with. There's, you can visit their site. If you don't, not able to take a trip by car, you can take a walking tourist trip. Mm -hmm. They have all the statues described there. Mm -hmm. It's an education. Mm -hmm. And then if you wanted to know more, you can find out, go read online, find out more news in the Winnebago Indian newsletter newspaper. Mm -hmm. So there's their website. Out at Winnebago, there's a Catholic mission, St. Augustine's Indian Mission, which has a long history. It's in Macy, Winnebago, Walt Hill. And what we're asking for an action here is consider a donation. They are building a new school. A little history of that is that in 1888, Bishop O'Connor was trying to get something going. It didn't happen until 1908. And this was the Omaha tribe and the Winnebago tribe, which were kind of enemies at one point, but they're working together. 
and um, they were able to obtain 15 acres for this St. Augustine Indian mission. And in 1909, Mother Catherine Drexel, who is in our Catholic tradition, she's the title of Saint Catherine now. She arrived in Winnebago with her sisters. They visited all the families, figured out how to finance and how to oversee the planning and construction. And the first students actually came that November. So they were very busy. Um, previous to that, they had problems getting financing. So help with the new school if you're able. Another take action, I was looking for things on Lakota and Pine Ridge and came across this website with all these projects that are being uh, promoted and assisted by the Friends of the Lakota Nation. And this was all described as at the Pine Ridge Reservation. So since our sisters had worked on the Pine Ridge, since 1937, um, this is connected with the Jesuit school system, the Red Cloud school um, uh, system. And the last little bullet thing there, it says that that system started in 1931. So there were other religious communities helping out there, but we came in 1937. And um, there are certain needs that Sister Rita helped me to see. So the sky is the limit. Our students prove that time and time again. And their specific needs include gas and bus upkeep, current textbooks, technology, the care of their buildings, and opportunities that could be provided for the young people. So thank you, Rita, for those clues. Finally, our um, partner that helped with this is uh, the MORE. They have two events coming up, Jan October 28th, Robbing North Omaha. If you want to know more, go to their website, um, just on, or their Facebook, whichever one. And then in January, which seems far away, but I have that book. It's very heavy and very deep reading. But it's the families who challenged slavery from the nation's founding to the Civil War. And the plan they have for January 20th is to really dig into the, that book. And this is a professor from UNL. It's his book. Maybe someone's listening who took his classes. And at this point, um, we repeat the information to contact uh, Dr. Polk over at the Health Coalition. And we want to, I want to thank Molly for organizing with yes, us. Yes, thank Molly. <laughs> for Sister Rita and then Sister Joy, who came with me to actually visit with Dr. Polk and get this deeper understanding <laughs> of what you've been doing here for 30 some years plus yes. in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And we wish them well as they continue um, making the health coalition a very strong service for this uh, group of people that were devastated by the westward expansion so thank you all yes thank you i was just going to thank again our speakers dr polk if you go on our facebook page there are a few more questions about voter registration and equity uh, in terms of democracy for native people so if you want to give those comments on facebook feel free to do so we have Expand Your Horizons uh, once a month. You can find us uh, online. I can add you to our mailing list so you can see what our next topic is going to be. Um, follow us on the Notre Dame Sisters. Follow the Nebraskan Urban Indian Health Coalition. And I would just like you to know that all of these slides and the video will be available on our website and on YouTube tomorrow for people who don't use Facebook. Uh, it'll be at NotreDameSisters.org. Um, is there any final words from Dr. Polk or Sister Rita? Sister Rita, I would love for to hear the, those words one more time that we use to end a prayer in the Lakota tradition. Mitakue Oasi. And that we means? Are, we yeah. are all related. And thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. And any final words from you, Dr. Polk? I certainly agree with that. We are all related. And if we really have that as our mantra, we will treat each other better. Thank you for this opportunity. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the company of Sister Rita, Sister Joy, and of course, Sister Cynthia. And you, Molly, I appreciate you handling this so professionally. I mean, you are a professional, but thank you so much with that. I appreciate it.
Thank you for spending your time with us. We are uh, a group of women who are constantly learning and we're happy to have experts uh, who come to us and teach us more. Thank you, Sister Cynthia, for finding these experts for us. We really appreciate all the work that both of you do um, and look forward to seeing our video online. Sister Cynthia? A shout out to my friend Deborah for introducing yes. me. Yes. Deborah, my Hi, Deborah. <laughs> I know she's watching. She was asking a few of the questions. <laughs> oh. And where's John Paul and his questions? We, we We've got, yeah, you'll see when you go into questions. the comments that you'll you'll know some of the names. <laughs> um, if you're watching for another program, I encourage you to look at the January one that's with the Moore organization. And I anticipate that we will be offering one in February. And so watch the news. Things happen. Have a great night, everybody. And thank you for watching. And we'll put this on NotreDameSisters.org in the morning. Have a great evening.